good morning, everyone. I'm calling to order the July 2021 meeting of the IHCDA Board of Directors. And we're meeting in person today. How long has it been? I know it's been over a year. I, yeah. 15. 15 months? I think. Oh, my goodness. March, April, it was uh, February of 2020 was last. Yeah. In person board meeting. Oh, my goodness. Well, it's so good to see everyone. Mm -hmm. And we are joined on the phone virtually by Michael Schottmeyer who's attending electronically pursuant to our simultaneous electronic participation policy that we passed last year. Uh, although we are not able to see Mr. Schottmeyer, we'll be able to hear him and he will be able to hear us. Uh, at the time the motions are made, each board member that makes a motion must state his or her first and last name for the record and all votes will be taken by roll call. Uh, so I will now take a roll call of the board members to confirm who is present for the record. Uh, I and Lieutenant Governor Suzanne Crouch is present. Uh, Mark Pasquarella for State Public Finance Director Dan Bucci is Mark here. Not yet. All right. Indiana Treasurer of State Kelly Mitchell. I'm here. Great. Board Member June Midkiff. I'm here. Perfect. Uh, board member Andy Place Sr. is absent, I do believe. Uh, board member Michael Schottmeyer. Present. Thank you. Board member Tom McGowan. Not present yet. Uh, and then our executive director, Jake Sy. Uh, present. Perfect. So the first item on the agenda is approval of the minutes from the June 24, 2021 board meeting. Are there any corrections or additions to the minutes? And if not, I will entertain a motion in a second. Please state your name. June Midkiff, I vote, vote to approve. Thank you, June. Get my mouth working. Kelly Mitchell, I'll second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Perfect, and opposed, nay. Motion is approved. The next item on our agenda is uh, the Emergency Solutions Grant Fiscal Year 2021-22 Allocations, and please welcome Albie Hilton uh, regarding that item. Good morning, Albie. Good morning. Good morning. All right, so I'm here to present about the Emergency Solutions Grant. Um, ESG is a federal formula grant that is administered by HUD and allocated to IHCDA. It covers uh, 91 of the 92 counties, so all but Marion. And there's three categories of funding. There's shelter operations, shelter outreach, and rapid rehousing homeless prevention. For the 2021 program year, IHCDA was allocated $3,944,639. And the funding was then split into those three categories. So for shelter operations, it's a little over $2 million, for outreach, $140,000, and for rapid rehousing homeless prevention, it's about $1.5 million. With this funding, we put out an RFP and applications responded in May or were scored in June. Uh, as we usually do, we had more requests than funding was available. And the applications were assigned points to the organizations based on criteria, including but not limited, limited to involvement in regional council meetings, board involvement, program services, and performance. HUD, the community services team, and our COC board set restrictions on the amount of funding organizations can receive through this uh, program. And they're based on each category. It's also based on whether it's a new organization or an existing organization. So for shelter operations, the max amount a current organization can receive is $60,000, and for new, it's $25,000. For outreach, it's 50 versus 25, and for rapid rehousing and homeless prevention, it's 250,000 versus 50,000. Due to the high volume of applications, subrecipients were, uh, we've allotted subrecipients a percentage of their requests. And those are based on a formula that includes, it incorporates the number of applications we receive, the amount of funding available, and the applicant score. These amounts are set forth in Exhibit A, B, and C uh, uh, based on the category of funding requests. And at this point, I'll take any questions. Any questions for LB? I have a question. Yes. So because 
um, none of them got the full amount they were asking for. Do you know where else they go to make up that shortfall? Yeah, they'll get private donations or use other mechanisms of funding. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any additional questions? Thank you, LB. And I believe you're going to be <clears throat> presenting on our next item, which is the Housing Opportunities for Persons with AIDS 2021-22 Program Year Funding Allocation. Wait, we need to do a recommendation oh. and then do a uh, approval of the board roll call. Oh, okay. So we have, is it, there will be three resolutions? Yes. Do you one? just want me to read them all at one time? That, does the board object to that? Is it all right, council, if we do them all together? Yeah. All right, please. We'll do that. All right, bear with me. It's a long one. <laughs> Staff recommends awarding an allocation of 2021-2022 program year emergency solution grant funds in an aggregate amount not to exceed $2,049,275 for the shelter program to organizations set forth in Exhibit A. Staff recommends awarding an allocation of 2021-2022 program year emergency solution grant funds in an aggregate amount not to exceed $140,000 for outreach to organizations set forth in Exhibit B. Staff recommends awarding an allocation of 2021-2022 program year emergency solution grant funds in an aggregate amount not to exceed $1,459,516 for rapid rehousing homeless prevention for organizations set forth in Exhibit C. Board, we have these three resolutions before us. Do I hear a motion for approval? Madam Chair, Kelly Mitchell, I move to approve. Thank you. I'll second, June Midkiff. It's been moved and seconded, and we will do a roll call vote. Lieutenant Governor Suzanne Crouch votes aye. Mark Pascarella is absent. Indiana Treasurer State Kelly Mitchell. Aye. Board Member June Midkiff. Aye. Board Member Andy Place is absent. Board Member Michael Schip Schottmeyer. Yes. Board Member Tom McGowan is absent. I don't know. You don't vote. No, I do not vote. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's been so long. <laughs> All right. Well, that resolution, those three resolutions do pass. So thank you, Albie. Now I think you're presenting our next item, uh, which I already mentioned was the AIDS program. So mm -hmm. if you would like to go sure. ahead. Perfect. All right. I will present on HOPWA or the Housing Opportunities for Persons with AIDS. Uh, this is also a federal formula grant that is administered also by HUD and then allocated to IHCDA. The funding is for low-income individuals and families who are living with HIV or AIDS. It can provide funding for long or short-term rental assistance, mortgage assistance, permanent housing placement services, uh, facility-based assistance, and more. It does cover the 91 counties, so everyone but Marion. And at the end of the 2019 program year, the HOPWA program served 6,451 Hoosiers who were living with AIDS or HIV, uh, which is actually a 9% increase in, in service uh, since the previous year. For the 2021 program year, IHCDA received $1,736,515 from HUD, and that's also an increase of about 9%. For that total, um, IHCD retains about $50,000 in administration costs, uh, and the remaining amount of about $1.6 million is allocated to partners across the state. This is a pretty specific program, so we do put out an RFP, but all of the organizations that can apply must also be designated care coordination sites to the State Department of Health. So you'll see that we only have seven subrecipients, and that's because those are the seven that are in our service area. Uh, the funding allocation amounts are determined uh, based on the need, so that we look at epidemiological figures from ISDH. Uh, we also look at pre previous program success, the number of households that were served, and the funding availability. This year, our request was about $1.5 million, which is less than the amount we could allocate. So the remaining $171,000 was divided among six of the seven agencies. The seventh agency, we uh, they only wanted to receive $25,000. They did not want to take on more funding. And part of that reason is because their service area is covered by Kentucky. So they don't serve as many people as the other care coordination sites. Uh, all of the other agencies agreed to receiving additional funds. Uh, and those funding requests and recommendations can be found in Table A. Any questions? 
for LB board members. Actually, I do. And mm -hmm. sorry, just right. maybe this is in here and I just missed it. How how long do they have to expend these funds? Three years. Three years. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And do they? Is this an annual? It is allocation. Yeah. And they, by and large, they spend all of their dollars. Uh, if there are no additional questions, we'll entertain a resolution. Mm -hmm. Staff recommends that the board approve awarding an aggregate amount not to exceed $1,684,420 in HOPLA funds to the applica applicants as set forth in Table A for the 2021-2022 program year. Board, we have a resolution before us. I'll entertain a motion for approval. Madam Chair, June Midkiff, I move to approve. Thank you. Kelly Mitchell, a second. It's been moved and seconded, um, and we will do a roll call vote. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Suzanne Crouch votes yes. Mark Pascarella is absent. Indiana State Treasurer Kelly Mitchell. Yes. Board Member June Midkiff. Yes. Board Member Andy Place is absent. Board Member Michael Schottmeyer. Yes. Board member Tom McGowan is absent. Uh, that resolution does pass. Thank you, Alby. Thank you. You're welcome. And please welcome Rich Harcourt. Uh, he's going to present a board recommendation for Biggs MFGP LLC. That almost sounds like the Jackson 5 song, <laughs> ABC. <laughs> Thank you for working through that. I appreciate it. <clears throat> So the purpose of this memo and the attached resolution is to request the approval of the issuance of the series 2021 multifamily housing revenue notes, BIGS MFGP LLC, not to exceed 13,900,000 of which 11,835,000 will be tax exempt. So uh, this is a project or projects that you as a board approved in December of 19 and all we're being asking for is the uh, the ability to, to be the issuer on the debt. This is non-recourse debt to, to IHCDA. It does cover uh, seven USDA rural development properties, uh, uh, saving 515 units in total. And those properties, uh, those locations are in all in Indiana, Akron, Goodland, South Whitley, New Pekin, Culver, Bluffton, and Vivi. Staff recommends the board approve the issuance of the series 2021 multifamily housing revenue bonds uh, attached as exhibit A. Any questions, board members? Rich, I believe we're ready for your resolution. Resolve that the board approve the series 2021 multifamily housing revenue bonds, parentheses, uh, BIGS, MFGP, comma, LLC project, close parentheses, Pursuant to the resolution attached here to as exhibit A as recommended by staff. Board, we have a resolution for us. I'll entertain a motion for approval. Move for approval, Mike Schottmeyer. Yep. Moved, seconded. So I'll second, June Midkin. It's been moved and seconded, and we will do roll call. Lieutenant Governor Suzanne Crouch votes yes. Mark Pasquarella is absent. Indiana Treasurer State Kelly Mitchell. Aye. Board member June Midkin. Yes. Board member Andy Place is absent. Board member Michael Schottmar? Yes. Board member Tom McGowan is absent. That resolution passes. Thank you, Rich. And I believe you also are going to present a bond recommendation for Foster's Pershing LP. Thank you. The purpose of this memo and the attached resolution is to request the approval of the issuance of the series 2021 multifamily housing revenue notes, <clears throat> Foster's Pershing project, uh, not to exceed 9 million of which 7.7 .7 million will be tax exempt. And just like the, uh, the previous presentation, uh, this is a, a non-recourse uh, tax exempt uh, issue that we are, uh, IHCDA is just the conduit issue we're on. Uh, this, uh, uh, this project you all approved in May of 21, um, and there, it is the refund or the uh, rehab of two uh, facilities, one in Newcastle, Indiana, uh, the other in Indianapolis for a total of 114 units. Staff recommends the board to approve the issuance of the series 2021 multifamily housing revenue bonds, Foster Pershing pro project pursuant to the resolution attached here to as exhibit A. Board, we have a recommendation before us. Is, are there questions of Rich? I believe we're ready for your resolution, Rich. 
Resolved that the board approved the series 2021 multifamily housing revenue bonds, parentheses, foster slash Pershing project, close parentheses, pursuant to the resolution attached hereto as exhibit A as recommended by staff. Board, we have a resolution before us on obtaining a motion for approval. Madam Chair, Kelly Mitchell, I move to approve. Thank you. June Mickett, a second. It's been moved and seconded. Lieutenant Governor <laughs> Suzanne Crouch votes yes. Mark Pasquarello is absent. Indiana State Treasurer, Kelly Mitchell. Thank yes. you. Board Member June Midkiff. Aye. Board Member Andy Place is absent. Board Member Michael Schottmeyer. Yes. And Board Member Tom McGowan is absent. That resolution passes. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Board. And now we have all been waiting anxiously a year to hear in person our Executive Director, Jacob Seitz, report. All right. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, just a couple updates here uh, for the July board meeting. Um, our Housing Assistance Fund, which is um, a foreclosure prevention program that is coming to IHCDA to be administered to uh, prevent foreclosures for our homeowners. Um, Back in June, on June 7th, we had issued a, an RFP um, and we had received about 13 responses to that RFP. Um, and we're still um, reviewing those responses um, right now and doing our due diligence. Um, in the meantime, during this process, uh, we've also been able to, um, Mark Neelan, who is running our hardest hit fund program, who did an outstanding job, um, has left the agency, he had a great opportunity in the private sector um, and really excited for him on his career. Um, outside of IHCDA, um, we've uh, filled uh, the Housing Assistance Fund Director's position with Chris Nevels, and Chris is here, uh, right back here. I, <laughs> I told him this morning I was going to introduce him, so I wanted to embarrass him a little bit. So, um, but we're really proud to have Chris um, on our team. Uh, Chris has been our manager of our home and CDBG program uh, for the last few years and has done a great job, and so we're excited to have him uh, uh, take a more leadership role on this very important program, the Housing Assistance Fund. So Chris is going to be leading us on that program um, and has been uh, helping us uh, through the RFP process. And uh, so our due diligence on that, um, our goal was to actually get it to the board this month in terms of a recommendation for um, the contractor to uh, support the administration of the Housing Assistance Fund. However, with the 13 responses that we did receive, and the, the level of diligence that we need to do. Um, we're still a few more weeks away from that, um, getting that implemented and making a recommendation. So with that, um, it is important, this program is extremely important that we get the program up and running as soon as possible. There are some steps we have to go through with the U.S. Department of Treasury um, and, our, and our state plan. Um, we're still, uh, Treasury is still providing us with additional guidance on that plan and the timeline may or may not be moving on us uh, with some additional guidance that they're giving, uh, giving out. So I know Chris and the team was on a call just last week and uh, still there's still some information that uh, we're waiting from Treasury on in terms of being able to submit all the documentation that we need to submit. Uh, but with that being said, uh, we still need to, um, as soon as possible, uh, make a final determination on the contract uh, for the Housing Assistance Fund uh, from the RFP. And so one of the things, um, I don't know if waiting till the August 26th next board meeting is the right thing to do for us to make a final decision here. So I'd like for the board to consider uh, potentially hosting a special session, uh, maybe the week of August 9th, that we can make a recommendation to the board to approve um, the contract for the Housing Assistance Fund. I know we haven't done any special sessions um, in the recent years. Um, however, it is, uh, we, we can call a special session. I think we do have to give about a 48 hour notice to the public before we have a session. Um, but I do think even though it's two weeks, that may not sound like a lot of time, but with this program, with all of our programs, um, time is really of the essence. And so we really wanna move as quickly as we can once we procure uh, properly procure uh, the contractor for our housing assistance fund. So I would like the at least the board to consider hosting a uh, having a special session, uh, maybe the week of August 9th, so that we would probably just be there may be just be uh, one agenda item, um, and then we would have an, our August regular scheduled board meeting on August 26. But I'll, I'll stop there, and answer any questions. I know Dave, if we have 
questions about how the process might happen or what we might be able to do in terms of a board meeting. I know we may want to have some parts of it be virtual again, just because it is a kind of a last minute thing. So um, I'll, I'll pause there, but. Could we do the meeting virtually? So it's not a hardship to those that um, are you know, from outside of Indianapolis. Yeah, I'm sure that is something that I'll be discussing with the public access council. That understands right now we have to do it like we're doing this meeting today, um, either in person with everyone, or if someone decides to be remote, to do it the way that we're doing it now with the roll call vote. But I'll be contacting the public access counselor based on the board agreeing to do that. I will contact him and, and ask him if we can do it all virtual because of the fact that it's a special session. Thank you. The minimum requirement, though, Dave, correct me if I'm wrong, it's we would have to have three board members present in the same location, one location. So, That's yeah. Correct. Okay. It doesn't have to be here. Ladies. So there we go. Yeah, I think we could. Yeah. We're here. Uh -huh. Okay. So, we could we we could have three board members, one location, then the rest of the board members being virtual. Yeah. Okay. So. So, that, that was. Uh, so I, I'm just, I'm, I'm assuming it would be okay if we go down this this route of maybe hosting a special session, maybe the week of August 9th, so that we can uh, get this approved and um, yeah, and answer any questions that the board may have. So, Jake, Mike Schottmeyer, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Mike. Um, may I suggest an, another alternative, which would be to, to move our monthly meeting up to that week? And that way we would only have one meeting. Is it possible to have the other agenda items moved up? And then that way, um, that week actually for me and travel, because I'm one of the travelers, uh, is better than the week of August 23rd. Yeah, I'll need to, to confirm with uh, my team to see what okay. other agenda items they were planning to uh, put on the August 26th meeting. Um, I, I let me double check on that and make sure that we can or or the other option could be can we postpone any of those items to the September meeting as well I don't know how time sensitive some of those agenda items are um, but yeah it's certainly we could look to add additional agenda items if the board would be okay with that um, to take to the board and, and maybe we could um, just um, remove the August 26 board meeting and actually maybe move it up so I'll work on that, Mike, and, and see what we can do. Yeah, I have, uh, just for the record, I mean, August of that week, August 12th is the one day I couldn't make it, uh, that Thursday, but the other uh, four days I could be there live. Okay. The other option could be we could uh, go the following week, the August, I guess that would be the, the week of um, August 15th. Um, that could be the other option, another week. Um, I just don't want to go to the, I don't want to really wait to the August 26th board meeting to procure the contractor. I'd like to move as quick as we could on this. And you all, you would communicate that with the board? Yes. Members. Yeah, we will work with all of you to confirm the date uh, that works for everyone. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, well, we'll work on that. Mike, we'll, we'll see what we can do in terms of maybe adjusting the actual board meeting date uh, in August as well to accommodate um, other agenda items as well. Um, the hardest hit fund, as I mentioned, um, Indiana, we were fortunate enough to be one of the few states um, who was able to continue administering the hardest hit fund and is a foreclosure prevention program. And in fact, we were in a recipient of additional funding from the U.S. Department of Treasury uh, for these funds uh, because of um, our ability to hit certain benchmarks. Um, and then the Treasury Department had reallocated some additional funds that had not been used um, under the hardest hit fund program from other states. So uh, with that, we were very fortunate to get a, a permission from U.S. Department of Treasury to extend our program. Uh, it was actually set, supposed to sunset last year, last spring, uh, but I remember back in April, uh, actually might have been actually in March of 2020 when everything began uh, within the pandemic, we had immediately reached out to Treasury and, and talked to them about the idea of being able to have a one-year extension on the HHF program. And so um, they did. 
they did it for us, and they did it for a few other states. Um, but I do want to give you an update on kind of where we, what we performed and, and what some of the outputs were from April 1st to June 30th with our hardest hit fund program. The HHF program has sunset. Uh, July 1st was the last day of the program um, under uh, Treasury uh, supervision. So that program has sunset. Uh, we did uh, provide assistance uh, to 1,279 homeowners uh, for uh, foreclosure prevention. Um, and that actually equaled about $177 million of assistance that we did provide uh, for HHF during, uh, that's total. Uh, from April 1st to June 30th, we did about 12.4 million uh, in a mortgage assistance. Um, and that was on average about $9,600 per household is what we were providing in assistance uh, to those 1,279 total from the program's inception to June of this year, we've assisted uh, 14,150 homeowners. Um, and I'm sorry, we, we've, uh, I'm sorry, we have assisted 12,135 uh, homeowners um, is what we've assisted. Uh, that is 177 million uh, total. And the average amount of assistance is about $14,800 uh, is what we've been able to uh, provide average per household. In addition to that, we also um, had implemented one of the few states who used the HHF money to um, get a special permission from Treasury to do a blight elimination program across our state. We were the only state that had a statewide blight elimination program, and uh, we tied that to foreclosures because we recognized that uh, vacant and abandoned homes were a contributing, a major contributing factor to adjacent homeowners in impacting their property values, which oftentimes then led to foreclosure. So uh, we uh, uh, allocated uh, just under, was actually just under uh, $50 million for a statewide blight elimination program that we have are right now in the process of winding down. Um, and uh, we will also have um, a website that's up that shows every property that we have demolished uh, across our state. Um, so that the public can go in and see that the homes um, and now that are lots or that are many of them are actually being reused now for other purposes. Some of them have been uh, reused for new single family homes. Uh, we've had a few for multifamily. Uh, some have been uh, used for uh, parks and pocket parks and things like that. So there's uh, so they're uh, being put back into the community uh, in other forms as an asset. So really proud of the team that we have at IHCDA with the implementation of HHF. And so um, now as we turn the page and go to a new chapter, Housing Assistance Fund, uh, we're excited to, to launch this program as well, uh, hopefully here as soon as we can. So to help our homeowners who may need assistance from the pandemic. So, uh, so that's just a quick update on really the foreclosure prevention uh, initiatives that we have at IHCDA. So may I ask a question? Sure. How does, say, someone who's maybe they never needed assistance before, how did they learn about this program during a pandemic? Yeah. You got the information out. Right. You know, on the HHF program, um, during the pandemic, um, we, we, um, we were working really closely with our community. Um, not-for-profit organizations because uh, they have homeownership counseling agencies across our state uh, so that we were working closely with them. Uh, we did outreach also with the uh, faith-based organizations um, to help with um, especially some of our, our, our uh, underserved uh, communities um, and, and, and supporting um, making sure that that message and that information was getting out because with the program with HHF and with the Housing Assistance Fund it does cover all 92 counties. Uh, unlike most of our other programs where there are certain larger cities that run their own programs, this program will covers all 92 counties. Um, so, um, so a lot of it did, uh, we really leaned heavily on that grassroots effort with our not-for-profit network and specifically the housing counseling agencies, our community action agencies, uh, area agencies on aging were also very helpful in helping get that information out. Um, and so, um, and then also with our faith-based organizations where we had specific uh, media campaigns for them. So, yeah. And our mortgage holders aware of this program as well? Yeah, yep. Yeah. So that was another way we worked uh, closely with uh, 
with mortgage lenders and the Mortgage mm -hmm. Bankers Association to make sure that they were aware of this information as well, because the lenders had to participate as well. Okay. Um, so we would, you know, actively engage um, the the mortgage lenders to uh, participate. So yeah, and then they could get that message out directly to those that are are past due on their mortgages. So we also work closely with the uh, Indiana Habitat for Humanity because um, some of their homes would also be eligible as well. So we work with them. Thank you. Yeah. Jake, how restrictive is the money? I mean, are, I'm assuming there are specified reasons you can use it. Yeah, with the, with the housing assistance fund, there does have to show a hardship uh, from the pandemic, whether it be a loss of income, uh, increase in medical expenses, uh, very similar to how the Ber Indiana Emergency Rental Assistance Program, uh, you do have to show some level of hardship. So, yeah. So once we um, get some final guidance here from Treasury, we'll be able to submit our plan um, that um, will lay out a little bit more detail on, on some of that. And also we'll work with our whoever we uh, procure with our contracting agency to work with them too on helping with uh, uh, finalizing the the program too as well. So yeah, it'll, it'll probably look very similar to the way we've handled uh, and administered the hardest hit fund program. Any additional questions? Uh, yeah, the other thing is, well, well, we'll talk about, we'll make a final decision on the August board meeting. Do we, we want to go with a special session or do we just want to move up the August 26th date to uh, an earlier date and see what, what we can do about that? So that might be an option we could, we could look at. Mm -hmm. so, but uh, we'll, we'll plan on either way, um, in-person, virtual, probably a hybrid model, probably is what we'll probably end up doing. So, yeah. Yep, that's it. That's it. Um, can you, now that this is our first kind of in-person meeting, can you kind of comment briefly on how the agency weathered the pandemic storm and some of the challenges you all were presented with that, uh, you know, you've been able to kind of pivot and you know, be, be nimble in terms of getting Hoosiers what, you know, the assistance <clears throat> they need in kind of a very trying time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, when um, in March of 2020, and actually I believe it was March 13th of 2020, um, yeah, that was the last day we were in the office. Um, we had made the decision 48 hours before then uh, on March 11th that we were going to uh, go remotely 100% uh, for the office. None of us knew how long. We, we all thought maybe just a few weeks or a few months, but clearly it turned into over a year. Um, we we're very fortunate to have um, a, a, an environment within the agency that embraced continuous improvement and embrace change. Um, if we didn't have that environment, I think it would have been a different scenario to play out for, for us because we had to know we, we were changing. I mean, uh, while the work still had to get done, how it was getting done, how we interact with our partners, because they're the ones who actually do the work and understanding what the partners were going through too as well, because they also were um, met with some significant challenges. Um, and so I know back in, in March, one of the first things that we did was, um, thanks to your leadership, was to schedule weekly calls with our partners and our not-for-profit housing service providers, uh, our developers. Um, we, we, we hosted, I think on, on a week, we were probably having at least 15 calls every week with our partners, our key partners, and, and just getting them on the call um, some of it was they wanted to know what we were up to, but a lot of it was they just wanted to have the opportunity to have an open venue, to have a conversation, um, understanding where things were going, because all of us were trying to figure out what was what was happening, where were we? I know there was a lot of concerns related to um, um, the homeless population as it relates to their, their mobility um, and how they were being exposed to the, to the virus uh, and then just the stay-at-home orders that we had. So... All of that was taking place. And so really what we did was, um, in addition to just being able to move the, the, the business line onto a, a virtual world, um, we had these weekly calls. Um, and uh, everyone in our agency participated in that. And everybody in our agency um, was engaged in those calls and just listening uh, more so than trying to, you know, 
change policies and everything at that point. We're at that point, we had to just move to being able to listen, listen and understand what role our, our new role was. And so with that, it, it turned out really well. Financially, as um, in April of last year, we also uh, felt some um, changes in the market that impacted our financials. Um, I know we were very concerned about the single family market as it related to the foreclosures and the forbearances that were taking place and what did that mean for us to carry certain types of reserves financially for us. Um, so, um, but we weathered that, you know, we, we hunkered down, we put into place uh, spending uh, and cost containment efforts to really be uh, mindful about where we were going uh, and still delivering a high level of customer service. And so actually as a result of all of that, uh, we had probably one of our best years on home ownership and single family. <clears throat> Uh, turned um, did did really well. I mean, I think last year was our best year in terms of home ownership that we had done for the agency, which helps us with our um, financials as well. Um, so uh, that that turned out really well. Um, we did have to do some delays uh, with the tax credit program and some of our funding award rounds where we had to delay them a few months. You know, normally the tax credit awards were made in November. I think we ended up making those in January, so we're two months behind because. Um, we had to shut down uh, a lot of tax credit applications before they come in. There's a lot of work that's being done on the site, and we have properties that are senior properties doing market studies, uh, appraisals, um, capital needs reviews, you know, physical inspections. We couldn't allow that to happen, um, especially at senior properties or any property at that point. We couldn't have people just showing up and uh, during the middle of a pandemic. So we did have to we had to close that down. Uh, but that also came out of just having these weekly calls uh, with our partners, our developers, our market study analysts, um, and getting their feedback on how do we navigate through this um, this time, that time that we're going through. So, um, and then as you go into this year, um, we continue to work remotely um, until March um, in, in April, um, where we started to have some some of the team members starting to come back. Um, and then in May, our management team all came back into the office. Um, they've been in the office since May. Um, and then obviously on July 6th, uh, we opened our doors up again. Uh, we are fully open. Uh, we do still have some staff that are working remotely. Um, actually, because of the additional programs that we have, we don't have enough uh, space, physical space anymore <laughs> for to hold all of our all of our team anymore. So uh, we're working through some things as it comes to that challenge of our just our physical space um, in terms of. Uh, but um, you know, if the office is open. We are uh, meeting with uh, folks if they want to meet with us. I know I've been uh, meeting with several folks, and it's nice to see a lot of people, a lot of familiar faces that I haven't seen in over a year. So. Uh, we've been doing that. Overall, I think the agency's done fairly well. Um, we are, we, I mean, I'm not saying we don't have challenges. I think there's some, definitely some challenges. One of the challenges that we've experienced, um, there has been some turnover within the agency. It's healthy turnover. Uh, we have a lot of folks, as I mentioned, I, Mark, Mark Nealon had a great opportunity. We've had some other folks who've had some really nice opportunities. Um, and so there, there has been some, 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 some turnover uh, in some key roles within the agency. Um, those are all good things um, because not only the person has a great opportunity for their career, but gives us an opportunity to bring up some folks who uh, can 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 demonstrate who has demonstrated they have good leadership um, skills and and a passion like Chris who understands the mission of the agency. Uh, so there's some great opportunities there that we're seeing too as well. So um, it again, it's continuously there's continuous change taking place and we're trying to evolve with it. So. I, I think as a board, we appreciate not just your leadership, but the dedication commitment of the IHCDA workers uh, yeah. during a very, very challenging time. So thank you. Thank you. Is there any further business to come before the board at this time? If not, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I move to Kelly Mitchell. I second June Midkiff. <laughs> it's been moved and seconded. I don't think we need to take a roll call, do we, Ms. Council? No, we do not. All right. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. We stand adjourned. Thank you.